I'm Adam Kaprosh from Musician. Uh, I just want to start with a quick question. Who here knows what Musician is? Put up your hands. All right, we have quite a few people who have been to our stand, I guess, but let's start with a little bit of background information about why I am here and why I'm talking about menu systems here. So Musician is a pretty big company. We are 66 people from Helsinki, Finland, so we flew in from the far corner of the map there. And uh, basically what we do is we teach people how to play musical instruments. And we don't do it the traditional way where you go to a music teacher every week and then he's listening to you and giving you like pieces of paper to practice. But instead we have an application that's uh, listening to you play and uh, tells you if you made mistakes, tells you if you're playing well, and it teaches you how to play songs. So you don't have to do lots of theory if you don't want to. You can just straight up start playing songs and we support currently four instruments, uh, guitar, piano, ukulele, and bass. And well, why am I here then? Because this sounds really like an application, not really a game, but well, truth is, Musician is built with Unity. So we're, we're taking gamifying learning quite seriously, and we had this core idea that, all right, if we, if we really want to gamify this, we have to build it as a game. So that's why we choose Unity, and the app is available for uh, five platforms, iOS, Android, Linux, uh, Mac, and Windows. So basically, uh, using the same UI with Unity, we are able to uh, write the application once, and then it's working on all the different platforms. And the reason I'm here talking about menu systems is that in the application, we have tons of menus. Uh, the list you see here on the right is just I, I searched for menu in our uh, project, and it shows menus from A to D. So that's not even the full list. That's just the very beginning. And because of that, we had to build a pretty solid system, especially that we, we are 66 people. Most of our people are developers. So uh, we had lots of prefab conflicts and things like that. So we had to find a way to really to be able to work in parallel and have a solid system. But really, uh, if you want to learn more about musician, check out our booth. And of course, we are hiring people. So uh, you can apply. But so much for the shameless self-plug. Let's get started with the real deal. So. If you were ever wondering, like, do I actually need a menu system? I'm just going to have like a pause menu, and that's going to be it. Well, let's, let's explore that a bit. Because of course, if you start working in a game, it's probably you're going to start with some gameplay prototype. You're going to build like a nice 3D scene. And then you're going to start adding a few menus. Like, all right, you got to have some pause menu. Because what if you want to drink a quick cup of coffee? You got to pause the game somehow. And then you keep adding more and more. OK, let's have a main menu. Ah, I want to have options, a credit. I want to have some shop for my net purchases, things like that. So it starts building up. And even if you're thinking, OK, I'm just organizing my stuff well, and it's, it's working, well, that's your menu system. Even though you're like not explicitly building a menu system, you will still end up probably building some UI manager or whatever class to help you with everything. And that's basically your menu system. So during this talk, my, I plan to like give you a few good ideas like, OK, how to design an architecture that will not break when you add five more menus. Because sometime down the road, you will add more and more menus. And basically, uh, it will slow your development down if your menu system is not capable of handling, like, OK, adding 10 more menus. And then you will have to worry about sort orders and all that sort of things and performance. So let's design our menu system. That will be good. Well, first off, of course, we want to avoid prefab conflicts because they are the worst. And well, the best way to avoid it is to just have as many prefabs as possible because then if somebody, like for example, touches the main menu and I'm working on a pause menu, if they are in separate prefabs, then we won't have conflicts. So the bad case is when you have just one like monolithic menu prefab or, or just have it actually all in your scene. Uh, the better way is to actually have separate prefabs for every single thing. And that also helps you avoid these uh, spaghetti prefabs where you have the options menus, button actually calling something in the main menu, things like that. So you really want to avoid that. And having them in separate prefabs helps with that. We also want to keep it kind of simple. Uh, one way to keep things really simple is to use singletons because, well, it's really convenient to work with singletons. You don't have to worry about, like, OK, how do I reference now my main menu? And if you don't need multiple instances of the same menu, which is in most cases true, then it really makes your life easy. Of course, if you want to have two options menus at the same time open, well, then you cannot use singletons. But let's assume now that 
we don't want two options menus because we just have a regular application, no like multiplayer with four different options menus. So if that's fine with you, that will simplify your life. Just to give you a quick idea, here is a picture from yesterday's keynote. Sorry for the low quality. I took it with my phone. They have this thing where they have like UI manager instance. So UI manager is a singleton, and then they call get screen with a string parameter to get their screen. That's, uh, that's pretty weird. Of course, if anybody renames anything, you cannot just refactor it easily. And then they call get component on it with the actual class, which is the same name as a string, and then they do stuff. But if they, they were to use singletons, you could just use a, a two-line call instead of all these things. So it does make life much easier. And also, you might want to keep your memory usage low. So basically, you, can all, all, you, you have to keep it in mind that having a game object in your scene is actually eating memory. It's not too much, but it's a bit. And if you have 50 menus, they will all add up. And of course, loading your scene is also slowed down by how many game, game objects you have. So basically, a bad idea is to put, put everything in your scene in the beginning and then uh, just like activate or deactivate those menus on the fly. The good way is really to instantiate menus when you need them, because instantiation is, is pretty cheap, and uh, it, it doesn't affect memory too much. So that's a nice thing. And when you, like for example, you go to the options, you instantiate the options menu. If you return from options menu to the main menu, then you can destroy the options menu, because you don't need it anymore. And that way, that also keeps everything nice and clean. And it also helps with uh, having 60 frames per second. For, for making sure that you have like a silky smooth game, you have to make sure that uh, what you're not using is disabled or, or not even presenting the scene. Because if you have lots of game objects enabled, if, even though you're drawing on top, uh, the GPU will still, still draw the menus underneath. So you will end up eating lots of draw calls. Or even if you like, for example, disable the renderer, the update will be still called on all those game objects. So usually the best way is to either destroy it or just disable it, and then it won't eat up all your performance. And finally, you want to make sure that you handle keyboard, keyboard input. This is something uh, like if you're developing for mobile, you, you like to ignore it. But then unless you're exclusively developing for iOS, you have to worry about the Android back button, which in the Unity input system is handed as an escape key press. So essentially, even though Unity is helping a lot with mouse and touch input, because then all the buttons work as expected, if you press a button, it, it will get the event and not the button underneath it, hopefully. <laughs> But with, with keyboard, if you're listening in an update function, then anything that has the update running will get, for example, the escape key press or the back button key press. So you want to make sure that on, only the, the top menu gets that back button. And of course, it's also good if your application doesn't just quit every time somebody presses the Android back button. So that way, you will never get featured in Google Play. So all right, we now have all our kind of design goals, and now it's time to kind of build it. We're going to first build it for one menu, and then we make it reusable. So this is our list of design considerations. And the first one was, OK, separate prefabs, separate menus. There isn't really much to do there by code. We just kind of need to make sure that, OK, for every uh, prefab I have, I want to have a separate class. So we, we can just create like a menu class. It's completely empty for now. And then this we will build into this uh, class that we use for every single menu. So second design consideration is to keep it simple, use singletons. So we add the singleton pattern that we have like a property or a field, whatever you prefer, for some instance that you can always just access statically. And then we declare our awake and onDestroy functions where we uh, set the instance and then we set the instance to null. And just one thing to keep in mind, we plan to like inherit from this menu class, so therefore it's important to make sure that this function is protected, so it can be accessed by the, the classes from, from which you inherit, and it must be virtual so you can override it. So you can like, okay, in some class I want to do some additional stuff on awake. If, if you do not override it, uh, then you can, you usually accidentally declare a brand new awake function, and then you, Unity ends up only calling that, but not calling the one we declared here, so your, your singleton instance will never be actually set to the current instance. So you will end up like with a broken system. So make sure that's like a protected virtual or public virtual if you really want that. 
All right, so we got that. Now we have to keep the memory usage low. How do we do that? Well, we have to figure out like, how to instantiate our menus. And for that, we need some menu manager. And also, to keep things simple here, we're going to have a singleton menu manager. Uh, so we kind of pat copy the same pattern there, awake, on destroy. Of course, we don't plan to inherit from the menu manager, because it's just going to be like one, thi one thing. You can even put it like, to be a sealed class. Uh, so you can, it's fine to use like private void, awake, and on destroy. Unity will still be able to call it, even if it's not a public function. So OK, we got the single Tom menu manager. And now we have to figure out how to instantiate it. So uh, we can declare like a field that, OK, this is, this is going to be our menu prefab. And then we can put some function to actually open that thing. And for now, that's going to be just a really simple instantiation that it's going to instantiate that menu prefab as a child. And uh, then from the editor, you can assign the actual prefabs that you have saved in your project. So this way, you can keep your scene and uh, prefabs clean. All right, so next, Silky Smooth 60 FPS, the hardest thing ever. Uh, well, for that, we need to be able to disable the menus that are underneath our current menu. Uh, so we need to build some sort of stack for that. And for that, luckily, we, in the system collections generic, we have a stack class already. So we can create a, a stack from menus. And then we can create these open menu and close menu functions. Uh, and then this was our instantiation. We just add this extra step to, like, we, we look at what's on top currently. And then we deactivate that thing. And then we push our current menu into the stack. And when we close something, we, we remove it from the stack. We destroy it. And then we reactivate the top menu if there is any. Of course, it's possible that your menu stack will be empty. So you have to make sure otherwise, if you call peak, there will be an exception. So with that, uh, we got four out of five done now for a keyboard input. OK, so we can add this to our menu manager. We can add the, the update function into the menu manager so we don't have to declare that in every single menu. And then what we do, OK, if somebody press the Escape button and we have something in the stack, then we take the, take the menu stack's top menu, and then we call this onBackPress function, which we can declare here. And it can do whatever we want to. It can like, simply just close this menu, which is usually a typical use case. Or you can make it all quit the application. Or for example, if somebody presses the back button during your gameplay, you, then you can actually open up a pause menu, for example. So with that, you can make sure that your main menu will not receive the back button when you're actually in the pause menu. So with that, we got like all, all five design considerations done. And we got this thing for one menu. But of course, we want more and more menus, because one menu is never enough. So let's use generics to be able to deal with that. Who here considers himself to have the knowledge of generics? All right, pretty good. I'm, I'm very glad to see this, because they are a very powerful tool. Uh, the reason we need generics is that we want to have that uh, singleton instance there. See? And the issue is that we need to have a type for that. And that type has to be the menu we will be using. So we declare generics this way, that you can actually provide the generic type to be uh, whatever your menu's type is. And you can set this res restriction, which, as you can see, is actually like uh, pointing back to the same thing we have. But luckily, C Sharp is capable of handling this. So this way, you can make sure that you can call all the functions that is declared in your uh, menu class. So the, the only difference is that really we, we change this from menu to this T, the template. And then in a way, uh, we actually have to cast this to T, because uh, we, we're not sure, quite sure what it is. But this, this cast will always work. And then on destroy, we still set it to null. And then, of course, we still have our, our, our regular menu class, because if, if you actually want to work with generics, uh, you, you cannot just say, OK, here is this generic type. I want, it, I want to cast it to menu something. You have to either cast it to menu uh, like main menu or m menu options menu. So you have to have like a non-generic base class if you want to work with the generics easily. And that you can actually keep all your non-generic code there. For, so for example, the on backpressed, we can leave it there. But then the uh, singleton things, we have to move to the generic class, because that's why we're dealing with generics at all. And then uh, here is an example of, OK, let's create two menus 
most typical use case, like, okay, name any options menu, and then basically this way we declare our class, and in a template we provide the same class because that's going to be the single pons type. And then in the main menu, we declared, we override the own backpress to actually quit the application, and in our options menu, we do the same thing with the template, and then we just actually close this menu, and that will make us return to the main menu. So that's some two very basic menus. And then we also need to make some changes to our menu manager because it has to be able to instantiate these different types of menus. So we can actually like declare a generic function. So the menu manager is, is still like non-generic, uh, but we can declare an open menu function which is generic, and that can cause also some magic function called get prefab. For now, we are really just keeping this simple because it has to fit on the slides. So now it's like manual. If we are requesting main menu, then we're going to instantiate the main menu prefab. If we are requesting options menu, then we're going to instantiate the options menu prefab. And I know this is like horribly ugly in manual, but don't worry. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I will have the full code for uh, doing this properly, nicely, automatically. And, uh, the, the project is also on GitHub, so you will be able to just grab the whole thing, no need to copy text from slides, luckily. That would be horrible. So this way, we can instantiate like any menu we want to. And we want to make sure that we avoid code duplication. So we can, for example, de declare in the menu class some open and close functions uh, that call the menu manager and instantiate the menu and open it, and then the close function would call the menu manager's things to remove it from the stack and get it destroyed. I recommend these to be protected, so not publicly exposed, but still static, because uh, based, based on the menu you have, you might want to actually pass some data to the menu. So let me show you an example of that. Uh, normally, you have like si very simple menus where you just want to have some showed or hi hide functions without any parameters. Because, for example, if you have an options menu, you just want to show it. If you have a pause menu, you just want to show it. But if you have some complex menu that actually takes some data, that you can see on the bottom, uh, this show function has a string parameter. Because, for example, th this menu will always display me some text. So, for example, this is some dialog. Then I can have like button text and title text. And then also for the height function, if you want to, you can also have different uh, things that have to be called in order to kind of have the results. So for example, which button was pressed on this like yes, no dialog we had there. Uh, of course, if you want to, you, you can always have the parameterless show function. But in some cases, it, it might not make any sense. Like, why would you show uh, a dialog without parameters? It's going to be totally empty. So you can just like have a separate uh, parent class for that, for your simple menus, and then the comp complex stuff you can just inherit from the original menu class. And you also want to avoid code duplication uh, in on backpressed. So for example, instead of having just an abstract function which uh, doesn't do anything, you can declare that, OK, by default, I want my, my backpress to close the menu. And then, for example, in your main menu class, you can override it and then say, OK, in this case, I want application quit. And I'm, I'm not calling the, the base on backpress, but instead, I'm just doing this other thing. So then it doesn't matter what, whatever was declared here. And this way, in the options menu, we don't have to declare our own, own backpress. We can just use the default implementation, because that's mostly what we need. All right, so now it's time to wire it all up in Unity. We need two menu prefabs. In this case, the uglier is the better. So we have some really basic main menu with the play and options. And then we have uh, an options menu with a single slider, which sets how awesome the game will be. And then there is a back button, just in case, for like uh, desktop and iOS users, so they can go back to the previous menu. And that, that's, these are our two prefabs. And now we have to uh, make sure that uh, they are actually like calling each other. So in the main menu, uh, we declare an on options pressed uh, but, uh, function that will actually show the, the options menu and look at this beautiful single line like thing that will actually instantiate my menu, put it in the stack, all sorts of things. It's very convenient. So your colleagues can actually figure out how to open that options menu so they don't have to copy like 20 lines of code to be able to open just one menu. And then we hook that up to a button here. 
and then uh, for the options menu to be able to return, we don't actually need to declare another function to go back to the previous menu. Instead, we can just hook up the button to this on backpress function that is already declared in the menu class. And then we need to kind of figure out, OK, we have this scene. We have some menu manager there that has the links to the prefabs. But then how do we show our very first menu? So we can just put that in the wake of the menu manager to call main menu show. And basically, that's, uh, that's all you need to, to make, make sure that this works. So let's do some live demo. Let's, let's see if this breaks or not. So I have my Unity here. And let's run it. So we have our beautiful main menu here. We have our options. And I can actually show you that. So right now, we have our menu manager here. And then we have this m main menu instantiated, but nothing else is instantiated. And now if I go to the options, then I can also show that in this case, we have the, the options menu instantiated as well, and the main menu is disabled. So it doesn't use any additional like GPU resources or CPU resources. So that's a really quick demo for this one, but we're going to return for the more advanced features soon, because I did promise some improvements. Because this is, was really basic stuff so far. So OK, what if you want to do some customization? There, there might be certain menus you don't want to get destroyed all the time. For example, if you're, you're your pause menu, you might want to actually keep that alive, because it's frequently used by users. And if it has like a pretty heavy instantiation, then you might not want to like have the ga game freeze for like 0.1 second when they pause it. So you can add some options to the menu that you don't you have this destroy when closed thingy, and then you, you can set it to true by default. But then uh, when you create the prefab, you can opt out. And uh, you can also have, have this uh, disabling of menus that are under the current menu disabled. Because what if you would just want to have some pause menu, which has some like uh, small gra gradient there, but you're not completely blacking out the gameplay. So uh, we can add these options. And in the code sample, these are all completely implemented. We can also set the canvas sorting order automatically if you have these see-through menus. So you don't have to worry about, like, OK, if I have a shop, it has to be sorting order 7. And if I want to have sh something on top of the shop, it has to be 8. Otherwise, it will not show up. So the menu manager can actually just look at, OK, what's on top of the current stack? I will get the sorting order of that. And I will, like, plus 1. And that will be the top menu sorting order. So then you can just have all your prefab zero sorting order and never worry about sorting orders ever again. And the last thing I promised is that you can get the uh, menu manager prefab dynamically. So here is some reflection code for that. Uh, what this code does is that the e either, either the public fields that you declare or the private fields you declare with the serialized field attribute, it will grab them dynamically. And then it, it will instantiate uh, whatever is said there. So essentially, this is some reflection magic that will autom automatically take all the prefabs you have drag there with Unity, and then it will instantiate those menus. And some final words. So every game is unique, and you will have your very own use cases. Uh, you might want to have multiple options menus. Uh, but this is a good starting point for this thing. And uh, make sure to, that you actually ta tailor your menu system to your own needs. Uh, you can get the whole project with all the improvements on GitHub. This is a short link for it. Uh, feel free to fork it, contribute, make pull requests, and uh, basically feel free to suggest improvements and have some complaints as well. Up to you. And now for a quick demo time with more things. So as I mentioned, we, we can have the option uh, to pass data to certain menus. So this magic button will pass uh, the slider's value to this menu. So if I change it to some low number, then it's only 18% awesome. If I put it all the way up, then it's 100% awesome. So this way, we are passing data between menus nicely and clearly. Uh, if we go back, we can have some gameplay here. And then we can have our pause menu here. And the escape button is working nicely, so you can have your uh, like overlay without actually show, without hiding the whole full main gameplay, whatever you have there. And then you can have some quick quit main menu, which will actually destroy everything else. So basically now, after playing our game, 
our scene is again pretty clean. There is only a main menu here. There is no more pause menu or uh, gameplay menu. All right. So finally, question time. Let's start with you. I, I will repeat the question, so feel free to. I tried that solution some time ago. Mm -hmm. Because if you have like thousand prefabs, they all will be loaded into main memory, mm -hmm. even though they are not distance. Oh, yes. So basically, the question was like instantiating on the fly has this downside that Unity has this factory pattern that actually like all, all your prefabs will be in the memory, all those links, and then when you call instantiate, it makes a copy of that. So that's like one downside, but still uh, like. Unity is pretty smart with that. So the, the prefabs are kind of a compact form. And then uh, when you actually instantiate it, then it loads the whole thing, which is actually, like, I think, like four times the memory. So it's, it's still like 75% smaller. It's still there in the memory, but it's a bit nicer. And just one more question. Um, uh, when it comes to reflection, um, did you have any trouble with IL2 CPP stripping things out because it's not directly the reference? Uh, yes. So uh, one thing that IL2 CPP never strips out is, uh, is all these prefab references. Okay. So that's luckily not an issue with IL2 CPP. Okay. Uh, hello. Um, I was working on something similar, and I would like to know your opinion on something. Yes. Um, when I was doing the same thing, at some point, I started thinking of the in-game play as a, a prefab that I could also put in this system. And mm -hmm. then when I go into the game, it was just part of the flow to instantiate, open, and, and start working with it. And also. Do you also handle the, the moment where you sometimes want menus that are just pop-ups? And sometimes you have menus that just kill everything else and, and they present themselves as the whole thing that you want to show? The short answer is yes. <laughs> so I mean, all, all this supports it. Like, if, if, even if you have a, a main gameplay that's not UI, that's a 3D scene, what you can actually do is that, OK, you can just create like a fake menu that doesn't actually have any actual content and for example, let's turn this game menu into basically nothing. We can easily do that by just disabling all the canvas-related features. And then in the scene view, you can just put whatever 3D scene there you want to. And then even though your gameplay is 3D, it will be handled as, as one menu, and it can be unloaded and reloaded with a different level, whatever you want. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a question. How would you handle, uh, because you have separate prefabs for separate menus, mm -hmm. If you want to maintain consistency in, say, for example, buttons, like we can make a prefab out of a button, how would you keep the consistency in every uh, prefab of the menu without having nested prefabs? Yes, that's a very tough question. Uh, we are waiting for nested prefabs, Unity, <laughs> just in case you didn't know. I was there in Unite 2014 when it was announced. Then in 2015, still waiting, it would be very good. Uh, for now, what we do is that we basically uh, tag all the buttons, and then we actually have to write scripts that apply all those changes to the buttons. So it's right now a very manual process, and we would love to have nested prefabs there. There are uh, quite many uh, asset store options for nested prefabs. For us, sadly, none of them really worked. Uh, I don't know if it's related to our setup, but I guess our, our scale is like very big. So we have like 60 menus, lots of things. So for us, so far, none of the assets worked. Probably that's also the reason like Unity is not really using nested prefabs yet, because it's a very complex thing. Did you think as part of the system uh, handling things asynchronously? Excuse me? If, uh, did you think as part of the system handling some sort of asynchronicity? Uh, for example, let's say one of these menus, instantiation takes time. Mm -hmm. And you want to be able to cancel it in the middle, or give some feedback to the user, or yes. replace one of these prefabs by uh, something that you load from an asset bundle. Anything that, mm -hmm. when you trigger the menu, 
that it's not instant. It's, it's not a synchronous operation. It's a synchronous. Yes. So, so in the case of musician, uh, if you don't have internet connection, the app doesn't really work. Uh, so in our case, everything is asynchronous, which, is, which makes things really complicated, especially with .NET 2.0 uh, without async await. So basically, uh, my recommendation is that like, when you instantiate your menu, it should sti still show some very basic things. And then you can start loading things. And, and you should really implement this kind of interruption that, OK, if somebody gives up waiting for something in 30 seconds, then you will be able to just close that menu easily. So uh, I think this system supports that use case really well. Just make sure that you're, you're not doing like any blocking things. You're, you're, you're not waiting on update for some web request to return. Otherwise, your app will freeze for half a second. Or if you're somewhere like Middle East, uh, it will take like three minutes to complete a regular request, which takes in Europe half a second. Uh, hey, I'm Peter from Helsinki also. Nice to see you. Ah, <laughs> hello. Uh, have you guys evaluated using scenes with prefab references? Uh, sorry, can you repeat? Uh, have you guys uh, like thought about using scenes with prefab references instead of just using prefabs? Yes, so we, we are also using uh, scenes mainly for uh, our, our main gameplay mode related things. Uh, and what we usually do there is, of course, additive scene loading. But uh, of course, whether you use prefabs or scenes, I would say that in a sense they are a similar concept because you can just load more stuff, remove more stuff. Uh, and for the really big stuff, it, it is really better to just use scenes with additive loading, which then you can unload. And you can st still like use this menu uh, structure to, for example, in, in your awake, you actually like start lo loading some other scene. And then when that uh, prefab gets destroyed, uh, sorry, wh when that uh, menu instance gets destroyed, then you unload the scene. So you can just plug it into the like, show or hide functions. And that works nice, and it's also good for performance. Yeah, I was meaning like having a scene as a sort of menu and having the prefabs as, using as a template system, essentially. Yes, that's, uh, that's actually something like we're not doing, because we just don't really like the scene system, to be honest. Okay. Back then, it was like without all the additive, nice, asynchronous things, it was kind of blocking the app pretty much. But I guess uh, now, now that it's much better, that would be also an option if you have really big menu prefabs. Um, can you please tell us a little bit more about the animation system, specifically the, but so when you transition from one menu to the other, and then how you load the specific elements? And like, what's the trigger, and what, uh, what type of animation system you use, basically, on the UI elements? Yes, so uh, I left out the animation part from this thing. It's also not on GitHub. But basically, just so you know the concept, uh, when you have some menu animating in and men animating out, in our case, uh, we use like all the animation systems that are in Unity. We have legacy animations as well. We are sometimes animating from code with Dotwin. But to, to make the menu system support that, you basically, uh, what it currently does, as soon as it shows one menu, it disables the menu underneath. And if you have some nice animation in, some fade in, that will not work. So basically, you need to add some additional function to notify the menu manager that you finished animating in. And once the animation, once you call that, then it will disable the things underneath. And when you are animating out, uh, as soon as you start animating out, it has to uh, enable the menu underneath. And once you're done with the uh, animation out, then you can tell the menu manager that now you can destroy me because I'm done here. But it's basically just two additional functions, and then you can handle animations nicely. All right. Looks like no more questions. So thank you very much. And here is the link again. If you have some questions, feel free to email me. And enjoy your night. <laughs>